Good afternoon from South Bend. It is a beautiful Sunday here uh, in the studio. There's a train going by outside. I know I said that last week, but it's true. There's often a train going by outside and the bottom of the trains run right along the bottom of my windowsill. So it's a nice little view. I am here a week four of the DIY photography syllabus where I am doing some self-education on the theory and history of photography. I've been a photographer for a while now but haven't done any of this uh, education and uh, it seems to me that that is a mistake. And so I've been buying some photo books, buying some books you might have read in school if you went to school for this sort of thing. and. The plan is just to read it and talk about it in a pretty straightforward way here on the channel. And so uh, this week I'm heading into some travel. The next week um, I'm gonna be in New York City and Long Island uh, working a job. And then the week after that, I'm gonna be in Wheeling, West Virginia doing some walking and photography. I'm still planning on bringing my reading and um, filming these videos uh, while we're traveling, but it's probably gonna be on my laptop. It's not gonna look quite as nice as the studio here. To complement my travels this week, I got this book. It's called Hometown by Joseph Szabo. It's, it's a photo book. And his work primarily is of people and teenagers. Um, and this one is black and white photography of landscapes and buildings in Long Island, where he's from. And so I'm very excited. We're gonna be driving all across Long Island um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, actually, and uh, I'm very excited to bring this along and sort of flip through it as we're driving and uh, hanging out there. And then I think I'll talk about it here on the channel next week. But the focus this week is this book, Camera Lucida. I said last week that I was going to be getting into this and I have read part one, which is roughly the first half of the book. This is uh, not a huge book, um, but it's sort of in the canon of photography theory. Uh, it's the sort of book I mentioned last week that people um, often reference to me or mention, assuming that because I'm a photographer, I must have read it, which is not true uh, until now. And so this book was published in 1980. It's by Roland Bart. He actually died, um, sadly, just months after this book came out. And uh, it's a very personal book. So um, it's sort of his personal exploration of what is photography? Is photography a sort of definable uh, art form or practice uh, amongst what he would call the community of images? Uh, can we talk about photography the way we talk about cinema with sort of like uh, definable qualities and hard edges to it? And so he gets started right here on the first page uh, with sort of this statement of inquiry. He says, this question grew insistent. I was overcome by an ontological desire. I wanted to learn at all costs what photography was in itself, by what essential feature it was to be distinguished from the community of images. Such a desire really meant that beyond the evidence provided by technology and usage, and despite its tremendous contemporary expansion, I wasn't sure that photography existed, that it had a genius of its own. And so he sort of starts out here by saying that he talks about a photo that really had grabbed him at one point in his life. And that sort of emotional response to a photo um, it is where he sort of starts with this inquiry of seeing that there are occasionally photos that grab him and, sort of, and, and mean something to him and stick with him long past when he's looking at the photo. Uh, and um, But was having trouble sort of reconciling that with, um, this question of like, what is photography? When we talk about the photographer, what are they doing? Um, and uh, what is it about it that separates it from uh, just all these sort of other images that at this time as, um, you know, in 1980 and especially today, we have more images coming at us than ever. And how do we sort of look across the expanse of this community of images and say, that's photography and um, this person is a photographer. And he has an interesting method for going about this uh, line of inquiry. He um, recognizes that there are only certain images that really grab him and not all of the ones that we, we might be told are the photos that really should stand out to us that are like important photographs from important photographers. Here in chapter six, he says, 
I see photographs everywhere, like everyone else nowadays. They come from the world to me without my asking. They are only images. Their mode of appearance is heterogeneous. Yet among those with yet among those which had been selected, evaluated, approved, collected in albums or magazines, and which had thereby passed through the filter of culture, I realized that some provoked tiny jubilations, as if they referred to a stilled center, an erotic or lacerating value buried in myself however harmless the subject may have appeared. And that others, on the contrary, were so indifferent to me that by dint of seeing them multiply like some weed, I felt a kind of aversion to toward them, even of irritation. There are moments when I detest photographs. What have I to do with Atje's old tree trunks, with Pierre Boucher's nudes, with Germaine Cruel's double exposures, to cite the old, only the old names? Further, I realized that I had never liked all the pictures by any one photographer. The only thing by Steiglitz that delights me, but to ecstasy, is his most famous image, the Horse Guard Terminal, New York, 1893. He has a picture of that one right here. He goes on, a certain picture by Maplethorpe led me to think I had found my photographer, but I hadn't. I don't like all of Maplethorpe. Hence, I could not accede to the notion, which is so convenient when we want to talk about history, culture, aesthetics, that notion as an artist's style. I saw clearly that I was concerned here with the impulses of an over-ready subjectivity, inadequate as soon as articulated, I like, I don't like. We all have our secret chart of tastes, distaste, indifferences, don't we? But just so, I have always wanted to remonstrate with my moods, not just justify them, still less to fill the scene of the text with my individuality, but on the contrary, to offer to extend this individuality to a science of the subject, a science whose name is of little importance to me, provided it attains to a generality which neither reduces nor crushes me. Hence, it was necessary to take a look for myself. He then goes on to talk about that um, what he's noticing that as he looks across the old names, he calls them more what we might think of as the great photographers, the fact that maybe only one in their entire catalog uh, sticks out to him uh, might not be an indictment of photography, but might actually be sort of the path to understanding what photography is and what its, its power is in our lives. And that by sort of removing all of the rest of them from his field of inquiry and just focusing on these single photographs, he might be able to actually get to uh, what's going on inside him when he sees these photographs. A lot of the rest of this part one is concerned with these two Latin words that he uh, brings up as sort of ways of thinking about a certain photograph and, and why we respond to it the way we do. The first one is studium, and he talks about it here in chapter 10. What I feel about these photographs, and he's talking here about photographs that he doesn't really have much interest in. What I feel about these photographs derives from an average effect, almost from a certain training. I did not know a French word which might account for this kind of human interest, but I believe this word exists in Latin. It is studium, which doesn't mean, at least not immediately, study but application to a thing, taste for someone, a kind of general enthusiastic commitment, of course, but without special acuity. It is by studium that I'm interested in so many photographs, whether I receive them as political testimony or enjoy them as good historical scenes. For it is culturally, this connotation is present in studium, that I participate in the figures, the faces, the gestures, the settings, the actions. And he continues in chapter 11. The studium is that very wide field of unconcerned desire, of various interest, of inconsequential taste. I like, I don't like. The studium is of the order of liking, not of loving. It mobilizes a half desire, a demi volition. It is the same sort of vague, slippery, irresponsible interest one takes in the people, the entertainments, the books, the clothes one's finds all right. So the studium here, it's pretty clear there, is sort of uh, maybe uh, photo uh, photographs 
cultural positioning in the world. And that um, by there being some maybe overlap in your cultural positioning, that that might be why you're interested in a photo. Um, and just sort of the things of life that, uh, you know, like he's saying, clothes that are all right, uh, that, you know, you sort of see and they pass by, uh, but don't really stick out to you or stay in your mind uh, after it's right in front of you. Uh, as I've thought about this with my own work, I think that one way of thinking about the studium of my work for people is the city of South Bend. That um, even in, if a photo doesn't quite grab you, the sort of um, reason why somebody might end up with my book in their house is because they live in South Bend and the photos are of South Bend. That's sort of the studium of the photographs. And he, um, but he sort of pairs this with another term, punctum, that he says is sort of the key to understanding um, why a certain photograph might uh, live with you longer. The second element will break or punctuate the studium. This time it is not I who seek it out, as I invest the field of studium with my sovereign consciousness. It is the element which rises from a scene, shoots out of it like an arrow, and pierces me. A Latin word exists to designate this wound, this prick, this mark made by a pointed instrument. The word suits me all the better in that it also refers to the notion of punctuation. And because the photographs I'm speaking of in effect punctuated, are in effect punctuated, sometimes even speckled with these sensitive points. Precisely, these marks, these wounds are so many points. The second element, which will disturb the studium, I shall therefore call punctum. For punctum is also sting, speck, cut, little hole, and also a cast of the dice. A photograph's punctum is that accident which pricks me, but also bruises me is poignant to me. And so from this point where he introduces these two terms, um, he then sort of sets off on an exploration specifically of this punctum as an idea and goes through some specific photographs to sort of uh, bring this idea out more. Here we're jumping forward to chapter 22. Nothing surprising then, if sometimes, despite its clarity, the punctum should be revealed only after the fact, when the photograph is no longer in front of me and I think back on it. I may know better a photograph I remember than a photograph I am looking at, as if direct vision oriented its language wrongly, engaging it in an effort of description, which will always miss its point of the effect, the punctum. Ultimately, or at the limit, in order to see a photograph well, it is best to look away or close your eyes. Subjectivity is achieved only in a state, an effort of silence. Such shutting your eyes is to make the image speak in silence. The photograph touches me if I withdraw from it. The photograph touches me if I withdraw it from its usual blah blah, technique, reality, repertage, art, etc. To say nothing, to shut my eyes, to allow the detail to rise of its own accord into effective consciousness. Last thing about the punctum. Whether or not it is triggered, it is an addition. It is what I add to the photograph and what is nonetheless already there. Do I add to the images in movies? I don't think so. I don't have time. In front of the screen, I am not free to shut my eyes. Otherwise, opening them, them again, I would not discover the same image. I am constrained to a continuous veracity, a host of other qualities, but not pensiveness, whence the interest for me of the photogram. And like I said, a lot of this second half of part one is him going through specific photographs that have this sort of punctum to him that have stayed with him. And he would say that the punctum is not even something that the photographer can be aware of or can plan, that if they attempt to, that they often will miss it. It's something that um, the spectator can only see for themselves and can only sort of discern for themselves over time as the image lives with them in their head uh, and um, it rises into effective consciousness, as he says. And so here at the end, uh, he sort of wraps up this, uh, this part one um, by taking us into where he's gonna go in part two. He says, proceeding this way from photograph to photograph, to tell the truth, all of them public ones up to now, 
I had perhaps learned how my desire worked, but I had not discovered the nature of photography. I had to grant that my pleasure was an imperfect mediator and that a subjectivity reduced to its hedonist project could not recognize the universal. I would have to descend deeper into myself to find the evidence of photography, that thing which is seen by anyone looking at a photograph and which distinguishes it in his eyes from any other image. I would have to make it my recantation, my palinode. And so this next week, I'm gonna be reading part two and I'm excited, at least from what I've seen online, it seems to get uh, even more personal for him and sharing some photographs that aren't public photographs, but photographs from his own life. And so uh, I'm excited to get into it. And so thanks for joining me uh, this week. That's all I have for you today. And uh, next week, I will see you from New York. <laughs>